we've ever had a Plato sing since my first day on that in a long time. So, Stu's not here today. I would say, welcome to Grace Church. What a great joy to have you here today. If you're visiting, my name is Dave Van Netten, and I have the privilege of pastoring this church. What a joy that is, and we are so glad to welcome you all here. We have some special guests with us today. My family is here. They're right here. They, they heard that I sometimes use stories from our childhood, so they're here to keep me honest. They, they're like right here lined up. So, okay. So, but I hope we get a chance to meet them. And uh, welcome, good to have all of you here. What a blessing to help share my, my 60th birthday on, on Friday. So thank you for coming all the way from Michigan. And they surprised me, so what a joy that is. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, before we go any further, we just want to acknowledge you and your presence with us today. We thank you, Lord, that you are here. Where two or more are gathered in your name, you are in their midst. And we claim this promise today, Lord. In your presence, there is life, there is health. There is healing, there is love, joy, and peace. The fruits of your spirit are down in our midst. Lord, come, touch us today. May we leave here differently than when we arrived. Change us, transform us, make us more like Jesus. Fill this place with your spirit. Fill it with your praises. Lord, thank you. Come, in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take a moment, find out who's around you, greet each other in the name of Christ. If you don't know their name, be sure to find out.
It is indeed our desire to give you all of the glory, that the glory would rise among us, not only individually, but collectively as a congregation of believers in you. Lord, it is our desire to sing along, to sing your praises with the entire universe, because the entire universe is indeed singing your song. And yet, Lord, yet, Lord, too often, something gets in the way. Our sin, our shortcomings, our failures, our guilt, our shame. Lord, forgive us. We need you. We need your grace. We need your saving. Father, we have not always been right with you or with one another. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Help us to trust him more. Make us healthy. Make us holy. Make us whole. In his name we pray it. Amen. <laughs> Save the wretch like 
running a little bit with a handicap today because when I teach my class, we don't even get to warm up together on Sunday morning, so we're going a little cold turkey this morning. Thanks for bearing with us. What a great joy to be with you today. We welcome all of you who may be listening online or watching our video or listening to our podcast. Thank you for being a part of our extended Grace Church family as well. What a joy to be together today. It's a cold day. Did you notice? Does it feel good to be alive, right? I took my walk this morning. It's like, whoa, that wind is, is uh, alive. So that's good to know. Today we are jumping into Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. In my Bible, the section is entitled, Made Alive in Christ. And I want to read these verses for you today. The words are on the screen. You may follow along there, or even in the Bible if you wish, in the pew. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of God. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, just say it with me, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Would you sign it? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for worship. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word, for its clarity, for its power and strength in our lives. Would you come, speak to us through it. Anoint this message. Anoint the messenger. Anoint us all as we listen and hear what it is that the Spirit is saying to the churches, even to Grace Church today. We don't want to miss it, Lord. Open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray it. In all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters loved by God, today is Reformation Sunday. I know that you were looking forward to this all week long. I know that you jumped out of bed this morning thinking, oh my goodness, today's the big day. Reformation Sunday once a year. What am I going to wear today? Oh, what a special day, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it was 506 years ago this Tuesday, October 31, back in 1517, that a Roman Catholic monk named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Luther could no longer keep quiet about the misguided, even sinful practices of the Roman Catholic Church in his day. He had to speak out against the corruption and especially against the selling of indulgences to supposedly forgive and pardon sins. Can you imagine that? A letter signed by the Pope saying, you are forgiven no matter what sin you do. They went around selling these. What a great fundraiser for the church. Right? Everybody's. Martin Luther said, no. So on October 31, 1517, he made his beef with the Roman Catholic Church in his day. He made it known publicly. And a reformation of protesters was begun. 
Additional reformers like John Calvin and John Knox emerged a little bit later. The movement spread throughout Europe and into the Netherlands where it became known as the Protestant Dutch Reformed Church of the Netherlands. That's a lot to put on a sign out in front of a church. Too many words. In the early 1600s, Dutch settlers brought, uh, came to America and brought their Reformed faith with them and established the Protestant Dutch Reformed Church of North America. Another mouthful. Eventually, the word Protestant, the word Dutch, were dropped. And it became the Reformed Church in America, a name that we still hold today. I don't know about you, but I'm proud to belong to the Reformed Church in America. We have a rich, deep, biblical, theologically sound history for which we can and should be proud. We cherish the word of God. We lift it up. It is elevated. It is the highest authority. Our rule for faith, life, and doctrine. We celebrate the fact that we are reformed and still reforming. God's not done with us yet. Amen? Amen. We're not a perfect denomination, a perfect church by any stretch of the imagination. We have our issues. We have our problems, believe me. But God isn't finished with us. We can enjoy a rich heritage of faith for which we can give thanks. Are you proud to belong to the Reformed Church? Amen. Do we even know what reform means? Pastor, what does reform mean? Somebody asked you that, what would you say? So today, I thought this would be an excellent opportunity. We only do this once a year, and it is so good to have my family with me today on this Reformation Sunday, because I thought it would be good. I preach so many different messages, usually just once a year on Reformed Church and so forth on Reformation Sunday. I've done so many different things that I thought, what can I do differently this year? And I thought, you know what? I have never preached on the five solas of the Reformation. How many have heard of the five solas of the Reformation? I knew Carl, but I know some of you are very astute. Okay, not the silos. I know we're in farm country here on high, but it's not the five silos, green silos, okay? We're talking about the five solas of the Reformation. That is the finer points, five key points of Reformed theology. And I've kind of avoided this, I think, for years because I thought, wow, this seems a little bit doctrinal kind of a message, you know, a little different, and it's like maybe not all that interesting. And then I started digging in a little bit more this week as I was thinking and praying over this, and I thought, well, you know what? There's a lot of good news. There's a lot of good news in these five solas. And the best part of it is that my family here, my brothers and sisters, we all grew up in the Reformed Church. They're not all from Reformed Churches today. It, Kind of go, but they have the heritage. So if you have any questions whatsoever about the Reformed Church, you they're steeped in Reformed theology. You ask, especially the hard questions, go ask and can ask them after the service today, and they will give you all the answers of how you everything you want to know. So thank you, family, for being here to support this today. So um, five solas of the Reformed Church. Grab your outline. Let's take it off. Okay, here we go. Number one. Number one, so and this is Latin. You're going to learn Latin today, all right? We're going to learn a few Latin terms. No extra charge, okay? No extra charge for that free Latin. Sola Scriptura. What does it mean? Sola what? Scripture. Sola is a word that simply means alone in Latin. It's where we get our English word solo from, okay? So Sola Scriptura means Scripture alone. Just say it with me. Scripture alone. God's word alone. The early reformers were adamant that the Bible is our ultimate rule and highest authority in matters of life and faith and doctrine. Now we can read different versions. You might like the King James Version. I might like the NIV or, or the, the New Century Version or the Living Bible. That's great. That's fine. No problem. We may disagree about how to interpret various passages. We can debate vigorously. We might uh, discuss how to apply God's word deeply to our lives. And all of that is good. And there's room for diversity. But we must all agree that the Bible itself is our final authority. 
Amen? Amen. Scripture alone is the measure, the plumb line for truth. Not the Pope. Not a church or a church hierarchy or an ecclesiastical body. No priest or even a pastor has a corner on the truth. Just the Bible. God's Word, with His Spirit, helps teach us all things. 2 Peter 1 says this, Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man or a person, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, all Scripture, just say it with me, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, do you know what this means? Do you know what the good news is here? It means that you have everything you need right here in this book. It's, we can read commentaries, we can read books about the Bible, you can do all kinds of reading. This is the one book that is a must read for everyone here. Time and time again, year after year, the bestseller, number one bestseller. In this book, you will find wisdom for living. You will find hope. You will find insight. And you will meet your Savior, Jesus Christ, in these pages here today, in this Bible. John 20, verse 31 says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, the Bible alone is perfectly sufficient to lead you to Jesus. It's not a science book. It's not a rule book. It's not a how-to manual on this or that. It is the plan of salvation, God's redemption of humankind spelled out for you and me. The psalmist said, we put it this way, Psalm 119, 109, Your word, O Lord, is a light to my path and a lamp unto my feet. How's your relationship with God's word? Do you have a Bible? I hope so. Get a Bible. If you don't, come and see me. We'll get you one. Okay. Oh, are you reading it? Are you spending time just meditating on it? Oh my goodness, we're so busy today. Oh, I got all this to do. I got my agenda, my to-do list. I don't, but no, no, take time. Take time. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, says Hebrews 4.12. And the Reformers were adamant that the Bible is for everyone. It's for you. It's written in English. You can read it in English, okay? It wasn't was written in English, but it was in Hebrew, Greek, but it's translated for you. The Reformers said, everybody can read this book. Scripture alone, sufficient for your salvation. Read it. Number two, sola Christo. What do you think that one is? Christ. Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Say it with me. The man, Christ Jesus. Peter said in his sermon in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men or to people by which we must be saved. No other name. Jesus himself comes along and he says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The Reformers took these verses seriously. Jesus Christ alone is completely capable of mediating between God and you. He is the consummate high priest, the go-between. There's no need for any other or additional priest or prophet to provide us with new revelation or other pathways to God. Muhammad, Joseph Smith may have had a following, but the Bible does not recognize them as prophets. I'm sure the Pope was a nice guy back in the day of Martin Luther, but he does not carry the authority to forgive sins. Even Blessed Mother Mary is still but human. We don't need another king or priest or even a president or prime minister to act as sort of a go-between or to speak for God. 
to be God to you because Jesus already has done that. Hebrews 1.1 in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Say it with me. By his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. He made it all. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Read the gospel. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. He's the only one that rose from the first one. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Here's the good news. No one else is needed. Jesus Christ is enough. You have all that you need right now, today, in the person of Jesus to find salvation and abundance of life, peace, love, and joy in Him. God gave Him. He is your Savior, your solace, your rock, your refuge, your redeemer. Jesus is your friend, your forgiver, your first love. Jesus is your companion, your counselor, your comforter by His Spirit. He is your light, your life, your leader, and your Lord. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches through Christ Jesus our Lord. No one else. You can turn to him at any time, 24-7. Jesus will hear you. Jesus alone is enough. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him? Say, Lord, I've messed up. Lord, I fall short. God, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Jesus is totally sufficient. He is all you need, and he is given for you. Amen? Amen. Sola Scriptura, Sola Christo. Number three, Sola Vide. What's this one? Faith. Good, you guys are smart. I know you can do this. How does a person get right with God through Jesus? For the answer to that question, we turn to another Reformation rallying cry. The ultimate, and ultimately the scripture itself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace through, uh, you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Say it with me, not by works. Say it, yeah. not by works. The Reformers were firm on this point. Contrary to the practices of the Roman Catholic Church in that day, Reformers believed that faith alone was the necessary vehicle to receive the gift of God's salvation by grace. No amount of good works could save you. You didn't need to purchase by indulgences, sign the letter by the Pope saying you're forgiven. You didn't need to do this and that or the next thing in order to be saved. Even participation in the Mass, what we commonly call communion in the Protestant Church, does not save you. Faith and faith alone in Jesus is the only thing required of us in order to be saved. Faith alone in Christ is sufficient. Hear the word of God on this point, friends. John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. Galatians 2, 16. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, that's by works, but by faith in Jesus. Say it with me. But by faith in Jesus. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this good news is? It means you can stop beating yourself up for not being good enough. The truth is, no one's good enough. I'm not, you're not. No one keeps the law of God perfectly. No one keeps the law of God all of the time. No one loves the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength all the time. No one loves their neighbors perfectly. The fact is, we all fall short, but the good news is this. 
Salvation is not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus Christ has done. It's the difference between how religion is spelled and how Christianity is spelled. Religion is spelled D-O. It's all about what you have to do. Christianity, on the other hand, is spelled D-O-N-E. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. You just have to trust it. Believe it. Accept it by faith. It's so hard to do. We want we do works righteousness. We're brought up to we gotta earn it, we gotta work toward it, but this is our culture. And and but the ways of God are sometimes countercultural. Have you noticed? Yeah. Trust it. Believe it. It's God's gift to you. Good works are still important. Of course they are. They, they confirm your salvation. They are the fruit of godly living. It is our way of saying thank you to God, but good works do not save you. Let's be clear. No one earns their way to heaven. Are you totally trusting Jesus today? Oh yeah, well, of course I am, Pastor. We don't want Christian, but you know what? We tend to add on other things. You ever notice that? Well, I'm trusting, yes, I trust fully, but then if I could only do better, if I, you know, and it's good, we want to strive to be better, but it's, oh, I blew it again. We beat ourselves up. We say, you know what? No. By faith alone. Trust it, believe it, which leads us to the fourth point. Sola gratia. Sola gratia. You know what that is? Grace alone. Grace alone. You're pretty good at reading, right? So, that's good I knew it was Ephesians 2, 8, 9, once again, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift from God. It's almost too good to be true, right? Our salvation, yours and mine, a gift from God. Nothing we do, just like a big Christmas, a big birthday gift, you know, like a new time. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. Okay? Nothing we do other than receive it by faith. Someone once said that the word grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Maybe you've heard that. I love that. All of the riches of Almighty God, of heaven itself, flowing down from God through, through Jesus to us. That's grace. We don't deserve it. Your salvation was given not on the basis of your good works, your good faith, or your good looks, good thing for me, or any human merit, but purely and solely of God's benevolent, loving nature. And sometimes we wonder, can God save me? Will God be able to forgive me? Maybe I really messed up and I've done some things that I'm sorry about and I just don't know. And I maybe, maybe I'm one, just one step away from God just abandoning me and leaving me. We say, am I acceptable? How can I do? You know, the Apostle Paul had this concern too. We don't know exactly what it was specifically that he struggled with, but he refers it in the New Testament to his thorn in the flesh. You've heard that, right? 2 Corinthians 12. To keep me, he says, from becoming conceited because of these surpassing the great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. We don't really know what it was. There's a lot of speculation about this. Uh, was it a personal issue, a kind of a habit, a repetitive sin? We don't, we're not really sure. Maybe kind of an addiction. Who knows? Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power in your life is made perfect by your weakness. Friends, God is saying the same thing to you and me today. No matter what you've done, where you've been, how far you may feel away from God. God is saying, my grace for the repentant sinner, my grace is sufficient for you. Your salvation is God's work from beginning to end. That's what I love about Reformed theology. Be patient. God will get you to where you need to be. God will get you to where he wants you. His grace alone is totally sufficient. All you need. Amen? Amen. And then finally, sola deo gloria. Another great Latin expression here. 
What is that? God's glory alone. To the glory of God. At first glance, it might seem that this sola deo gloria is a bit of an outlier. Okay? The other four points address the debate between the Reformers and the Roman Catholic Church in matters of authority and doctrine. This one doesn't seem to do that. What was God's glory alone really ever even an issue? Uh, but for the Reformers, it, it was. Because even if the Roman Catholic Church of its day never overtly resisted the concept, God's glory is the glue and theme that holds all these other points together. And it comes right to the core of who's in charge? Who's doing this? Is it me? Do I somehow earn my salvation? Or is it God? Is it a gift from Him? The Reformer said, this is all a gift. Give God the glory. Give credit where credit is due. In fact, your entire lives are to be lived for the glory of God. It's why God put you on earth. To know Him. Enjoy Him. Give Him glory. In Psalm 115, verse 1, the psalmist said, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Say it with me, for the glory of God. And one of my favorites, Philippians 2. Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? For what purpose? It goes on. To the glory of God the Father. His glory alone. It's why we're put on this earth. It is a constant theme of Scripture. May all the honor, the praise, and the glory go to God. We are but actors in a larger drama. How are you doing in bringing glory to God? If somebody looked at your life, would they see something of God in you? In fact, is, it's often about the last thing on our minds. Glory to God. I'm just trying to get through that day. I'm just trying to get my to-do list done. I'm just trying to survive in life, right? He's like, but God calls us to a higher purpose. Your work, your studies, your speech, your hobbies to the glory of God. Your overtime, your downtime, your free time, your me time to the glory of God. May God be glorified in all that we do. And when you stop and think about it, who's more worthy? No one. Do we not have a great God? Amen. Do we not serve a great, great God? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Remember the movie, the 1984 movie, The Right Stuff? Remember this? Remember that? If you haven't, you, you, or if you have, you know that the movie is about Navy, Marine, and Air Force test pilots who are being trained and selected to be astronauts for Project Mercury, the first U.S. manned space flight. Some of you, how many anybody see the movie? Remember that? That was a few years ago. Okay, so we have. Good. Not the only one, all right? As the title suggests, it takes the right stuff in order to be an astronaut. Would these men have the right stuff? Would they have what it takes to, to be an astronaut? Turns out not everybody would. Only a few would be selected. And sometimes we wonder too. Do I have the right stuff to be acceptable to God? Is my life enough? Do I have what it takes? Maybe I've gone too far. Oh Lord, I sinned again. Lord, I've really messed up. I don't know. Do I have the right stuff? You know what the answer is? No. We don't. I don't, you don't. The Bible tells us all of sin and falls short of the glory of God, right? Okay. The wages of sin is death. 
We're in a bind here. We don't have the right stuff on our own, but guess what? God has given it to you. God gives you the right stuff. He's given you this Bible, this Word, everything you need right there. He's given us Jesus Christ who is totally all-sufficient for all of your needs. He meets every need. He's given you faith by which to believe. Even the ultimate antecedent of your faith is given by the Spirit of God. He gives us grace, undeserved, all for His glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you've got the right stuff. Do it. Come on. <laughs> praise God. Let's give it the glory. Let's praise. We know. Pray. Father and God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to just uh, um, just to kind of review a little bit of what our theology really is as a Reformed Church. We don't talk about it hardly ever. Uh, we just want to lift up Jesus. That's our purpose. But Lord, it is good to belong to a denomination, to a rich denomination of heritage, of faith, of belief. And we thank you for reformers like Martin Luther, who had the courage to speak truth to power. And we thank you, God, uh, for others, too, that trailed behind him, even John Calvin, and those who developed more clearly uh, the articles of our faith. And uh, Lord, articles not just held by the Reformed Church, but by most Protestant churches around the world today. And so we thank you for the work of these reformers. And even today on this Reformation Sunday, we, we remember our need. We remember our fallenness and our brokenness before you. And the fact that, Lord, you've given everything we need. You have given it all to us. All we need. Thank you, Lord. You have been so good, good to us all of our days. We give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise?
Thank you. Good job, Bev. A new song for us. So. You know what? We have a video. Are we ready? <laughs> I think we have a video. Yeah. We're getting a video ready for you. In the meantime, welcome all visitors. We, what a joy to have you with us. It's a, such a great uh, thrill to have visitors with us. We're all about visitors here at Grace Church, right? And so we welcome you and thank you for being a part of our fellowship this morning. And uh, we have a video. Do we not? box. There's instructions in the bulletin. There's a little brochure pamphlet on each of those boxes and you can fill it. You can return it to the church in the next few weeks and we will bless children all around the world with a gift for Christmas and most importantly the gift of Jesus. So feel free to do that. Uh, sorry that the video malfunctioned there but uh, you know what to do. We've done this before. A big thank you also to those who participated in our Trunk or Treat this past Wednesday. What another way to bless children here locally uh, with our Trunk or Treat. How many of you participated in Trunk or Treat? Yeah? Okay, many of you have. So, guess what? I won first prize this year. <laughs> Can I brag a little bit? Finally, Jonah and the Whale didn't do it. But the Apostle Paul in the Roman prison did, apparently. So, maybe it was because I gave out more candy. I don't know. But, uh, so, but we had a good... Good group. The fellowship hall was full Wednesday. 50 or so people there. Parents, grandparents. Thank you for coming out, for being a part of that. Uh, more than 20, 25 children or so, which is good for us. We, we just bless those kids. What a great time. Thank you to all who participated, who were a part of it. Thank you to the kids. Thank you to the parents. Thank you to the grandparents and everybody. What a great joy that was. And uh, it's a great outreach, really, for our church. So thank you for being a part of it. Men are inviting the women to join them for breakfast this coming Saturday, 9 o'clock. Carl's going to help lead that and provide some devotion, some spiritual food for us. There's going to be plenty of other good food for your stomach as well. 9 o'clock this coming Saturday, right here at the church in our fellowship hall. Men's and women's breakfast. And please sign up at the information station. We'd like to know how many are coming so that we know how much food to prepare. There are other sign-ups out there as well. Please check those out, uh, some for... Uh, greeters and others for nursery workers. And uh, on a personal note, I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for all of the gifts, the cards, and the goodies that you've given to me this month, Pastor Appreciation Month. Some churches don't even really think about it, but you do, and boy, what a blessing that is to me. Thank you. I'm so blessed to be your pastor. Thank you for the cards. Thank you for the, uh, the birthday wishes. And thank you to everybody who came out to the Pizza Ranch on Friday night and joined in. We packed those little two. I think there were more people in our reserve rooms than there was in the rest of the restaurant. <laughs> but it was so good. Hopefully you got enough food to eat. And uh, thank you again for helping me celebrate 60 years. Wow, isn't that great? So. <laughs> so figure I'm about halfway through with my life now. So. <laughs> Many prayer items are in the bulletin. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for birthdays. We thank you for life. Every breath that we breathe, every beat of our hearts, a gift from your loving hand. And so, Lord, what can we say? How can we give thanks? 
for the gifts that you give us, including that of Jesus Christ and our salvation in him. Lord, today there are many who struggle, many who are broken, including those of us in this room. We need your grace. We need your healing. We need your forgiveness. We need the new life that only Jesus can give. Come, Lord, by your spirit and grant it to us. We think of those who are grieving today. A friend of this congregation, Regina Huffman, who passed away Friday morning. Be with her husband, Jan, and their children, and all who grieve, a, a dear friend of so many in this congregation. Be with Russ and Jean Graham. Be with Tony Meather and Susan White. Be with our shut-ins, those who could not make it today, but are with us in spirit. Be with the lonely, the hurting, the grieving. Thank you, God, for Grace Church, for this place of refuge and solace, this kind of small church that has a big impact in the Cedar Valley. Thank you for our ministry. Thank you for Trunk or Treat and all of the beautiful children who came out to celebrate that on Wednesday. Thank you for our fish, our rock youth. Thank you for Kevin and Nadia Boyke and for their leadership in, in our children and youth ministries as our next generation ministry leaders. Thank you, God, for our small groups, our Bible studies, a men's and women's breakfast. Thank you, God, for the mission that we share, even through Operation Christmas Child, as we fill these shoe boxes, may your spirit go with us, go with those boxes. We thank you for Ron and Amelia in our talk and pray your blessing over their ministry, for all your scripture ministries, for Reformed Church Global Mission, for these causes that we support. Lord, use our mission dollars to further your kingdom here and around the world. Thank you for the rich heritage that we share as Reformed Christians. But Lord, mainly we thank you that we can lift Jesus up, that we can keep the main thing the main thing. So Lord, come. Refresh us and renew us. Grant us new life. We pray for peace in the United States and around the world. Peace in our own nation between warring factions, even in government. Peace in Jerusalem. Peace for Israel. Peace for Palestine. Peace for Syria. Peace around the world in Jesus' name. Our prayer is nothing less, Lord. And to that end, we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise and join Spirit of Grace for one last closing song of affirmation. Only Jesus.
Thank you for being here. I just want to take a little liberty right here, and I want to introduce my family to you, and I hope that you'll get to visit with them for a few moments after the service. My oldest brother, Mark, right there on the end. Wave your hand, Mark. Turn around so everybody can see him. He's ironically the one with most hair. I don't get that, but uh, there he is. His wife, Linda, next to him. Hi, Linda. Welcome, Linda. My brother, uh, Larry, right here. And uh, we, we kind of look a little alike, somebody said. And then his wife, Pam, right next to him. My sister, Sharon, right here, uh, who we've been praying for with her heart issues, and uh, she's been doing pretty well overall, not quite out of the woods, but so she thanks you for your prayers. Um, my sister, Mary, next to her, the blonde, she still has a lot of hair, too, so I forget, but uh, her husband, Keith, right here, so Keith, uh, right here, so. I hope you get to meet them. What a joy to have. This is probably uh, the first time that we have all been together here in Waterloo, Iowa at Grace Church that you've all been able to share. We've all been able to share a worship service together. And how many, I don't know that that's happened for decades. Probably back when we were kids at Calvary Reformed Church that we were all together in worship at the same time. So what a special Sunday this is for all of us. Great for us. out from Michigan and uh, being with me this weekend so yeah what a cool thing not to us says the psalmist not to us O oh Lord not to us but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness may God bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you.